This is the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Fur Neiman. If you're looking to generate wealth and passive income in the lucrative world of mobile home parks, you're in the right place. You'll discover solutions to the common legal and operational pitfalls and how to optimize parks to maximize income. Your host is in the trenches. He's a real estate attorney, financial analyst, and mobile home park investor and operator. Now, let's turn it over to Fern Neiman. Welcome back, Mobile Home Park Nation. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit more about closing documents. We've already gone over kind of a bill of sale when you buy a mobile home park and what's involved in that. We've gone over assignment of leases. Today, I want to go over just kind of the, the rest of the closing documents uh, at, at least from the buyer side, I'm going to leave out the lender docs at this point. That'll be that'll be more detailed in another episode. Things like a, a mortgage or a deed of trust, a promissory note, some of the uh, some of the ancillary documents related to lending um, and, and things of that nature. But today, I really want to go over really the closing day, kind of the documents you get at the last minute. One of these is your settlement statement or your HUD or your closing statement. It goes by different names, but it's basically the the Two or three page document that's got a bunch of a bunch of rows in it. Hopefully they're numbered. Some title companies don't number it, which blows blows me away, frankly. But some of them number them, and the numbers have things like, you know, gross amount due from borrower, and it's got a bunch of detail. Gross amount due to seller, and a bunch of detail. It's important to look over that instead of just trusting the title company because there are errors on these things all the time. Sometimes the title companies try to sneak fees on there. And they'll, they'll like try to charge you for an appraisal or, you know, I've even had banks try to charge me for an appraisal. And it's like, I already paid the appraiser direct or I've already paid that as a deposit. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, my bad. I'm like, yeah, right. Not buying it. But so you got to you got to watch your own money. I tell this people all the time, even like with your CPA or your financial advisor, nobody's going to watch your money as well as you do. And hopefully you're really watching it. But there's there's a lot of errors on these things. And really, it's not that hard to figure out. These are pretty simple, but I, I still see errors. So I mean, you've got the standard stuff you want to make sure you get credit for. Like if you put down an earnest money or deposit, you need to make sure you get credit for that. That's going to show up on here. You've got things like your loan amount. If there's any seller paid credits, like the one I'm looking at right now is I've got a lot for credit, 3000 And on this park, this was an Iowa deal. There was a lot for had a mobile home, had a title issue. So I got I said, you either fix it, go through all the titling and the Bannon Housing Act or the quiet title process or whatever it takes or I will. If I do, I got to pay fees and process and really just got to pay for brain damage for me or my staff. So I said, I want 3000 bucks for that. And they gave me a $3,000 concession. You want to make sure that any security deposits are transferred. The security deposits should be listed on that assignment of leases as part of the certified rent roll. Because those are, when you buy, those are liabilities. It's not your money. That's the tenant's money. And in some states, you're actually required to keep that in a separate segregated account. And in some instances, that separate segregated account actually has to even be interest bearing and you sometimes you have to have tell the tenants where it's at so you got to make sure you got credit for that and you've got to make sure you got all the regular prorations county taxes sometimes there's special assessments there's uh, obviously rent prorations unless you perhaps let you close on the first or the 30th some people will negotiate for in their contract or some states will have a preference that on the day of closing that day's rent goes to the buyer or it goes to the seller. So you gotta it's generally not a big difference, but you should you could negotiate it for it in your contract. It's it's one day. You wanna do the math. I see that math wrong all the time, especially in instances where there are different rental rates. You know, I just bought a park in Nebraska and there were some people at one sixty five, one eighty five, two hundred, two oh five. I don't know why they were different, but you gotta make sure you get the prorations right. You can't just say number of lots times two hundred, right? So just do the math. On those sort of things. And then look for anything that you're supposed to have received. So like on this deal, I've got a zoning endorsement and a survey endorsement, which are supplemental to the uh, title policy. Typically, the seller pays for the owner's title policy, the buyer pays for the lender's title policy, and the buyer pays for endorsements. So if you're getting the endorsements, one, at the end of closing, you want to make sure your title policy has those endorsements. Um, and it's all clear. But two, you want to make sure that they're on the closing statements because that shows that you're gonna, they're going to be on there, basically. You paid for them. You got the other standard stuff like appraisal fee, flood cert fee, wire fee, UCC fee. Um, sometimes you'll have settlement closes, settlement fees from an attorney or a broker. You've normally got title exam or title insurance fees, you know, one party or both. Recording fees, typically that's the buyer. Transfer stamps or sales tax stamps, those are typically the seller. Um, 
and then sometimes you have to record like the bill of sale or an affidavit, uh, those sort of things. So that's that's really how it works. Look through those. It's just a big math problem after that. I mean, it's basic addition and subtraction, frankly. But just add it all up. Make sure the amount owed from you if you're the buyer or owed to you if you're the seller is appropriate. And then sign off, right? And obviously make sure everybody signs off on this document. That's really the title company's job. But you want to make sure you get an executed copy. I always try to get an executed copy in PDF the day of closing and then get an original later. I, I haven't shown up a title company in like seven years. So I just don't close in person. And that, and I don't know why people do. You know, it's crazy to me. Just they'll FedEx it to you. They typically don't even charge you. So if, if you're cheap and you're like, I don't want to pay the $19, like they don't even charge you. But make sure your, your HUD statement is, is good to go. Other typical documents you want to make sure are good to go. And this is a state or city specific item. Is a, is, a, is a declaration of value or a certificate of value or basically some sales disclosure form. This will include things like how much you paid. And this, there's some subjective nature to this, which, as I mentioned in my purchase contract podcast episode, as the buyer in particular, I like to have some discretion or actually, frankly, total control over the allocation of the purchase price because this impacts my income taxes for things like cost segregation. Got a whole episode on that with Yona Weiss. And then it helps me on my property tax appeals. And I've got a whole episode on that. And it, it, for example, for most county assessors, which I used to be the county assessor here in Jackson County, you know, Kansas City, Missouri, they look for things like transfer documents. In, in Kansas City, Missouri, they call it a certificate of value, and they look for these for sales. Well, tax, tax assessors are only allowed to appraise or assess, and then ultimately the collectors will tax based on value that's, quote, ad valorem purposes, which basically means according to value. And it's, 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 real, it's typically real estate, or in some states also tangible personal property. So this time in the allocation of the purchase contract and this time at the declaration at sale in our purchase, you want to make sure you've got the right allocation there. It's got to be reasonable. It's got to be in, you know, consistent with your contract, um, or ideally. If you do a cost segregation study, it helps to have this in your contract, by the way. Um, but you can identify things as land, land improvements, personal property tangible, like lawnmowers and tools, uh, personal property tangible homes, like mobile homes or site-built buildings, and site buildings will typically be considered real estate buildings. Real estate improvements are things like roads, you know, signage, decks, fencing, uh, some sort of sometimes landscaping features, um, parking areas, common area parking areas, possibly infrastructure utility lines, depending on who owns them, who maintains them, and whether or not they're serving tenant owned or park owned homes. But this is important. So they get it right in the declaration of value. And typically there's some form of affidavit or penalty of perjury if you if you jack this up so don't mess with don't lie but you can not lie by planning in advance and negotiating better against the seller and most people are not sophisticated in this so you really if you are you can really negotiate well other typical documents at closing there's some sort of affidavit of identity or owner's affidavit this is typically a seller related document i mean it, it, it matters to the buyer if the seller tries to whittle it down and then you've got, which, which is pretty rare. Um, and I just faced off against an attorney who was very sophisticated and sharp, and he whittled that thing down. Well, then it it was so whittled down, the title company said, we'll agree, but it's going to jack with Ford's uh, survey endorsement, and, or zoning endorsement, one or the other. And I was like, well, that's not cool. So we ended up having to negotiate over that more so that I got my endorsement, and he, and he was comfortable. His dad was the, this guy was an attorney, his dad was the seller. So he was very concerned that his dad didn't, promise something that wasn't true, which I can appreciate. Sometimes there's other transfer documents related to if there's flood zone or groundwater hazard or things like that, but you don't have to worry about that for the most part. The title company will, will give you these documents and you can then ask questions or ask your attorney. Um, the, the last big legal document you see at closing is the warranty deed. Typically, I like to buy with a general warranty deed, which is more insured, if you will, more beneficial. There's more seasons of title and you know, they used to call in law school the bundles of sticks that make up real property um or real estate and the, when you basically reader's digest version if you have a general warranty deed like if i if i sold you my property via general warranty deed i am representing that i have all these different they call them seasons of title all these different bundles of sticks while i owned it and prior to my ownership like up the chain which is pretty bold because I don't know what was up the chain. So it's riskier as the seller to do a general. So when I'm buying, I want the guy to do have risk, right? When I sell, I sell under a special warranty deed, which says, look, I represent that I got what I got 
But I'm not vouching for the guy up the chain. So if he jacked it up, that's not my fault. Don't call, don't write. You're not my problem anymore. And, and that's pretty standard. Um, sometimes you'll have a, a trustee's deed or a limited liability company deed because of the nature of ownership. But normally it's either warranty, some form of general warranty or special warranty deed. And you never want to buy with a quit claim. That's Q-U-I-T, quit claim deed. Um, or at least you don't pay much for it. Because that basically means the, the purported seller is giving me whatever he or she owns, but they're not representing that they own it or that they have any rights. This is kind of like if you give away a mobile home, you do it via quit claim. If you have good title, you give good title. But sometimes you just, people give away mobile homes just like, I don't own it. I don't know who owns it. It's here. I'm not saying I own it. I didn't go through the Bannon Housing Act. Uh, if you move in, I'm not going to say anything. I'm looking the other way. That would basically be a quit claim bill of sale, which may or may not even be worth doing in writing, frankly. Um, but generally, you should not. There's, you shouldn't take any stock into it because they're not giving you any stock in it. It's it's a worthless representation. Warranty deeds are pretty boilerplate. They can be state specific. I'm unaware of them any of them being city specific, but they can be state specific. And in some states, you have to have a state licensed attorney in that state. So there's there are some states that I'm not licensed in, right? And I can do general real estate practice from my desk in Kansas City all over the country, but I can't do things like show up in court. And there are some statutory provisions like warranty deed. Like, I'm from Illinois. I own five parks in Illinois. I'm not licensed in Illinois. I just, I didn't, I left at 18, didn't like the tax structure, among other things. I never came home, right? Um, so based on that, I never got my law license in Illinois. I had to hire an Illinois attorney to do a deed for me, right? Just because that's part of the rules. So it's kind of annoying. But for the most part, I did all the legal work. I did all the rest of the legal work on my own on that case. I just couldn't sign off on the deed. So just make sure, and title, you can ask the title company that. They'll know the local records. Other than that, um, there's certain provisions, um, granting provisions and things like that that are in the warranty deed, but any attorney is going to have the template that knows how to do that. I wouldn't do it yourself. It's pretty inexpensive. I mean, if it, if it costs more than an hour of a legal service to do a warranty deed, you're, you're doing it wrong. Um, with, with very limited, very limited exceptions in my opinion. So anyway, closing day is exciting. It's important. Uh, whether you're buying or selling, you got to make sure that the, the HUD statement's correct because it's, I kid you not, it's wrong all the time. And sometimes I think it's wrong fraudulently, which reminds me of an interesting sidebar. And as you know, it's my show, so I get to do sidebars. You, if you want to hang up now, you can. I don't know if it's hanging up or, I don't know, I don't really listen to podcasts. Don't tell people I said that. Grocery business. My dad was in the grocery business. Neiman Foods is a big grocery chain in the in the Midwest here. And my grandpa, well, my great-grandpa, Ferd, Ferd Sr., founded it. And then Ferd Jr., Ferd III, my dad were in the business for a long time. And they didn't do this. But one trick in the grocery business is they would put a, they'd keep a broom right by the cashier. And the broom was like 12 bucks. And everybody that would go through that day, they'd, they'd scan the broom. And they just jack 12 bucks onto your bill. And most people don't look at their bill, their invoices. Well, if somebody notices, they get home, sometimes they go, ugh, whatever. They, they charge me 12 bucks for a broom I didn't buy. No big deal. And they just eat it. Or they just forget about it. But every once in a while, somebody would show up pissed. Hey, you charged me $12 for a broom. And of course, the broom would be right there in the aisle. And the cashier would say, ugh. You left it. It's right here. That wasn't my broom. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Let me let me just give you a refund then. And the person's like, oh, okay, good. And they basically got away with, you know, getting away, getting away, got away with trying to screw that person. And they got away with screwing lots of other people who were unsuspecting. So like, they give you that sidebar and say, I have literally caught title companies and banks doing that. 250 here, 200 here, uh, closing agent fee here, and... Maybe it was the accidental broom thing, but it it didn't it didn't pass the smell test for me. So, um, as I like to say, don't trust and verify, and that goes for your attorneys too, uh, your CPAs, your closing agents. Read read the fine print, man. I mean, it's just there's too many people out there taking advantage of folks, and you can avoid it by being diligent. So, be smart, be diligent. God bless. You've been listening to the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Ferd Neiman. Ready to learn more? Go to www.themobilehomelawyer.com for free resources and materials to help you succeed. If you love the podcast, go to Apple Podcasts. Give us your review and subscribe today. Thank you for listening. 
Neither the Supreme Court of Missouri nor the Missouri Bar reviews nor approves certifying organizations or specialist designations. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements.